The NTSB, of course, is an independent federal agency. The role is to promote transportation safety. Not just air transportation, but any transportation. And it does this by conducting investigations, issuing safety recommendations based on those investigations, and advocating for safety improvements. Now, the NTSB is recognized internationally as the preeminent accident investigation organization. Chairman Hurstman was first appointed to the NTSB as a board member by President Bush in 2004 and was then appointed as chairman of the NTSB by President Obama in 2009. Notice the bipartisanship there. In 2011, President Obama renominated her for a second term as the chairman, and she was unanimously confirmed by the Senate. Again, great bipartisanship. At the NTSB, her leadership includes a strong focus on aviation, thank you very much, and the timely completion of high-profile aviation investigations. Chairman Hurstman knows that aviation safety has no borders and the agency is an active participant at ICAO and the International Transport Safety Association. Prior to becoming NTSB board member, Chairman Hurstman was a senior advisor to the US Senate Committee on Commerce, Science and Transportation. Her work contributed to the passage of milestone transportation legislation such as the Transportation Equity Act of the 21st century and the Amtrak Reform and Accountability Act. Please welcome NTSB Chairman Deborah Hersman. Thank you, Barry. Good afternoon, everyone. So great to be here. Uh, thank you very much, Barry, for that gracious introduction. I would like to take a moment um, to introduce some of my NTSB colleagues who are here. I know many of you all got to talk with John DeLisi. John is our director of the Office of Aviation Safety, responsible for so many of those investigations that I'm going to talk to you about today. And I have my A-team here from the Office of Communications, Tom Zoller, Lynn Dorfman, and Kelly Nantel. Thank you all so much for being with us. And I know that you already got a shout out from uh, Barry, but Milan, thank you so much for uh, making your board meeting uh, occur during this time so you all could be here. Uh, thanks to all the awesome ladies of Iowa for, uh, for coming and being two tables strong here. So thanks for being here. And I know some of you uh, have met uh, or have worked with uh, Hans Ephraimson over the years. Um, I have to tell you, he is absolutely a gem. He is one of the most amazing gentlemen that I have ever had the chance to work with. And he is many things and has done many things over his career and his lifetime. But to me, he will always be a champion for those that we have lost too soon in aviation crashes. Thanks for being here, Hans. So it's so wonderful to be here with all of you at the Yale Club and to be attending and speaking at the Wings Club. Thank you for this invitation. I have uh, read so much about the Wings Club and your fabled history, your notable members and guests from C.R. Smith to Fred Smith, from Jacqueline Cochran to Catherine Sullivan. And it's clear from talking with so many of you before lunch that today's Wings Club members, it's the same as it was so many years ago. Aviation is as much a calling as career for you as well. You are all committed to this endeavor that Igor Sikorsky described so many years ago. Aeronautics is neither an industry nor a science. It is a miracle. As Wings Club members, you have achieved and witnessed so many of those miracles from your midtown perch here. In 1942, when the club was founded, aviation was seen as an instrument of war, an agent of peace, and a growing means of commerce. And look at the progress in that time since 1942. 
when your members were drawing up their first club bylaws, unlike today, the trip to the airport was safer than the plane ride. Fast forward to 2013. Talk about the spirit of St. Louis. Every day, the equivalent of the population of the St. Louis area is aloft in flights above the United States. Two million people every day, defying gravity, safely and surely. Today's safety record has been achieved through the work of many of you, Wings Club members, but also the entire aviation community, operators, manufacturers, regulators, labor, service providers, and yes, the independent accident investigator. As David Henson outlined to many of you all in the 32nd site lecture, a host of developments has brought us to this safety record we enjoy today. Improved airframes and engines, enhanced technology for air traffic control, weather detection, simulated flight training, and more. There's also a greater appreciation for human factors with improved practices such as crew resource management, Yet how did commercial aviation learn it needed these improvements? Most of the lessons were hard earned and learned through crashes, lives lost, and tarnished records. Accidents followed by painstakingly thorough and transparent investigations conducted by the investigator that Congress specifically designed to be independent. Independence, essential to the NTSB's effectiveness in finding out what happened and why, and recommending a path toward the solution. What I want to talk about today, defying gravity and building upon today's strong aviation safety record, and specifically about the unique role played by the NTSB. 400 people you may likely never meet, 400 people some of you may not want to know, but 400 people you all need to know about. Since 1967, the NTSB has conducted more than 132,000 aviation investigations. We've issued over 13,000 recommendations. Each year we investigate about 1,400 general aviation accidents and dozens of foreign investigations our teams assist our counterparts with. Right now, we're supporting investigations from Bagram to Bali, from Paraguay to Pakistan, and in many more places throughout the world. ICAO Annex 13 establishes the framework for working with our international counterparts, and Barry referenced this in his opening. We are all connected. There is no such thing as a domestic accident anymore. Whether it's an Airbus event in the United States, or a Gulfstream event in Germany. The value of US participation in foreign investigations, and likewise the participation of our foreign counterparts here, allows each of us to identify issues before they become problems at home. In short, NTSB participation provides US stakeholders with access to early findings and advances the safety of US products around the world. Yet with the last fatal US commercial airline crash, Colgan Air near Buffalo, 52 months or some 40 million flights ago, some of you might be thinking that the NTSB and independent investigation 
is so last century. And I know that at times, with NTSB's transparency and independence, you may love us or you may loathe us. If we're investigating your operation, your product, or your client, the spotlight is uncomfortable. No one enjoys the national glare of attention and examination, nor is an investigation's openness always welcome. But in other investigations where the focus is elsewhere, the findings and fixes may help you. They help the broader aviation community, and they certainly help our air travelers. Recall the Alaska Airlines MD-83 plunging into the Pacific Ocean in January 2011, 2000. John DeLisi, who worked on that investigation, recalls that operators quickly checked, they found problems, and the NTSB's materials lab looked like a jack screw farm because we had been sent so many units from around the country for examination. Our investigation was just starting, but there was a consensus among the investigative team that the jack screw assembly had experienced unusual wear. The result, operators promptly changed maintenance procedures on their MD-80 series aircraft. Safety was served. Who knows how many lives were saved? Yet love us or loathe us, commercial aviation needs us. It is the public, those 730 million passengers, that choose to fly on U.S. airlines every year that the NTSB represents. They count on an honest broker with the ability to identify existing and emerging safety issues and push for needed improvements. And just as importantly, the public counts on an independent expert to represent their interests in an investigation and to keep them informed. The FAA has investigators. Industry has investigators. But as the independent safety investigator, the NTSB is uniquely positioned to do the following three things. First, ask the tough questions. Second, call the balls and strikes. And third, challenge the community to find solutions to critical safety issues. So first, asking the tough questions. In our investigation of the 2009 Colgan Air Crash near Buffalo, we asked a lot of tough questions. Questions about pilot training and professionalism, about standard and sterile cockpit procedures, about pilot records, and more. But perhaps the toughest question that we asked was about pilot commuting. How can you be rested and ready for duty when you slept the previous night in a recliner in the pilot lounge and were answering emails at 3 a.m.? Or when you commuted the night before from Seattle to Newark via Memphis in the jump seat of FedEx planes? We asked, shouldn't there be better regulations for flight crew rest and addressing fatigue? In a recent investigation, we found fuel starvation in an emergency medical services helicopter crash. The helicopter pilot had been texting during flight, but also during pre-flight activities. The use of personal electronic devices is prohibited during flight. But we ask the question, what about during those crucial pre-flight activities? It's because of that congressionally endowed independence that the NTSB can ask those tough questions. 
Sometimes we raise issues that one side doesn't want to talk about. But sometimes we raise issues that all sides don't want to talk about. And there have been times when we have pushed and others have retreated. That is because the NTSB's only stake in the outcome is to prevent the next accident. Congress understood that where you stand really does depend on where you sit. The next one, calling the balls and strikes. Umpires don't pull in the big bucks. They don't appear on trading cards, and they aren't always popular. But they don't go into that line of work to win popularity contests. They do it to make a difference and to ensure fairness on the field. To a person, aviation professionals come to the NTSB to make a difference and to enhance safety in our skies. Like umpires, the NTSB calls them like we see them. And like umpires, we do it from a position of neutrality with an unbiased, up-close view of the action. So here's an example of a called strike. In our investigation of the October 2004 crash of a Pinnacle Airlines repositioning flight, we highlighted the pilot's unprofessional behavior, flouting the rules and taking the aircraft to its certification ceiling, flight level 410. We've called out controller professionalism as well, when right here in New York City in 2009, we had a Teterboro controller who was distracted by personal phone calls and a private plane and a sightseeing helicopter collided over the Hudson River, killing nine people. Frequently in investigations, just like in baseball, one team's strike is another's ball. But with our vantage point objectively behind the plate, the NTSB has the perspective to make the tough calls. And lastly, challenging the community to find solutions. We conduct investigations. We identify the facts and we flag the issues. Look at mid-air collisions. For decades, investigators went to repeated wreckage sites caused by mid-air collisions. Those investigations highlighted the need for a fix so that pilots could be alerted and quickly respond in close call situations. But it took decades before industry applied its ingenuity and came up with TCAS. Similarly, there were repeated CFIT crash investigations and NTSB calls to warn of approaching terrain. The response? TAWS. And then even more effectively, enhanced ground procs. Those inventions saved countless lives. It truly is the warning track before the fence for those outfielders tracking that long, high ball. In the TWA 800 investigation, we determined that the setter wing tank flammable fuel air mixture ignited to cause the explosion. We called for a fix. And in time, the FAA and the industry figured out how to reliably and more economically develop an effective inerting system. And all of you New Yorkers remember, just two months after 9-11, the American Airlines crash in Bell Harbor. Following the investigation, we challenged Airbus to make the rudder system on its A300-310 safer. It did. Airbus installed a monitoring system that warns pilots who reverse their rudder inputs. It used to take dozens of crashes and years and years of investigation between problem identification and solution. But today, responses are expected to be much quicker. 
For instance, when we flagged that New York City airspace issue in the Hudson midair, the FAA put together a work group and within months had implemented changes. While the NTSB has no dog in the hunt, we don't fly solo. The party system allows us to obtain additional expertise and provide stakeholders, many of you all, with a window into our investigation, allowing you all to see early and firsthand the evidence that you need to take corrective actions, such as in April of 2011, when the fuselage on a Southwest 737 ruptured. The plane diverted and landed safely in Yuma, Arizona. Our investigators identified a nine inch by five foot hole. Next, our lab's close examination of the skin found fatigue cracks emanating from rivet holes. Within days, the FAA issued an emergency airworthiness directive requiring lap joint inspections. The inspections revealed cracks in several airplanes, which were immediately removed from service and repaired. Safety was served. I did mention the importance of identifying and understanding emerging safety issues earlier. These can certainly be a challenge to all of us with the growing complexity of aircraft, engines, components, systems, and more. That's why on January 7th, when we learned about a lithium ion battery fire on a JAL 787 in Boston, we immediately sent an investigator to take a look. Fire on an aircraft is never a good thing. And the 787 is a new airplane, and as Boeing describes it, with a suite of new technologies and revolutionary design. We needed to know more. Was the battery fire, a ball, or a strike? We couldn't know unless we checked it out. On January 11th, the FAA announced that it would conduct a comprehensive review of the 787 critical systems, including their design, manufacture, and assembly. And at the same time, the FAA voiced its confidence in the 787's safety. Less than a week later, on January 16th, as we were tearing down the JAL battery in our lab, an ANA 787 performed an emergency landing at Takamatsu Airport in Japan after the pilots received a warning about smoke and a fault in the battery system. We sent an investigator to Japan to serve as an accredited representative on the JTSB's investigation. ANA and JAL grounded their 787s. The next day, the FAA issued an airworthiness directive for 787s to cease further flight. The FAA grounds a U.S. fleet. The first time a U.S. Aviation Authority grounded a fleet was after fatal Lockheed Constellation crash in 1946. The second grounding came 33 years later after a 1979 Chicago DC-10 crash that killed 275 people, still stands as the worst U.S commercial accident. This year, 34 years after the FAA grounded the DC-10, we see only the third commercial grounding in U.S. history. This is big, and the pressure was and still is intense to get to the root of the problem. Two incidents in two weeks on two operators' aircraft. Is it a ball? or a strike. In today's global aviation environment, with so much at stake, it's crucial to conduct a thorough, objective, and yes, independent investigation. We sent investigators to the battery manufacturer in Japan. We sent investigators to the battery integrator in France. We sent investigators to the battery charger manufacturer in Arizona. And we sent multiple teams 
to Boeing in Seattle. And we also brought in outside battery experts. In April, we held a forum on lithium-ion battery technology and transportation. And then a couple of weeks later, we held an investigative hearing on the 787 Boston event. These brought more witnesses, more experts, and more light to bear on these issues. We released an interim factual report in March, and we plan to re release our final report before the end of the year. But here's what strikes me about the 787 battery story, which is still to be fully told. It's a sign of how risk intolerant we have become. As air travel becomes safer and safer, the tolerance for risk, for failure, is reduced. Look at the biggest difference between this grounding and the last FAA grounding in 1979. No one died. We live in a different era now. We've seen 52 straight months without a fatal US commercial aviation accident. There are higher standards today and greater expectations, much greater. Yet the absence of accidents does not equal safety. Safely defying gravity thousands of times each day requires constant vigilance. That's because risk remains, and it always will. What the aviation community has done is learn and apply effective ways to mitigate so many of the risks that have been identified. And there's no credit from the public for your past achievements. Airlines are only as good as their last flight. What happens today is a given, and continued improvement is expected to safely defy gravity tomorrow. The consequences of failure can be dramatic. Yes, loss of life and injuries, but also a loss of business and hard-earned reputations. But there are no miracles in modern aviation. The remarkable safety record is the result of a lot of hard work by many players. With the reduced tolerance for risk and the public's high expectations, every player, every team, must come to the field with their A game, ready to play, and ready to respect the calls, whether they're balls or strikes. Thank you so much for having me today. Uh, we have just a few minutes uh, for questions. Uh, Chairman Hurstman has told us she's in the business of tough questions. Um, I hope some of you may have a couple of tough questions. So with your independent perspective, uh, how have you been involved or how has NDSB been involved in the next gen debate? The NTSB hasn't been directly involved as, as things have developed, but we certainly have made recommendations about things that we think would enhance the safety uh, of next gen moving forward. Certainly as we looked at uh, growing technologies, at things that were gonna be required in the future, things like ADSB, we made recommendations um, in that area, it's an area where we are actually a little bit disappointed because we believe that the full benefits of ADSB are realized only if ADSB in and out are uh, required. And so we're in a situation where we have glass half full or glass half empty. Um, certainly we're going to see some improvements and some benefits, but, but we believe that there's more that could be done. That's just one example. Quick question. The aviation community is about to go through its largest generational shift since the 1960s. Is that a field of the study for the NTSB? The NTSB held a forum on pilot and air traffic controller professionalism. This is actually one of our deliverables after the Colgan event. And I think we heard from a lot of people that the corporate, commercial, you know, and other pipelines are very different now than they were 20, 30, 40 years ago. I'm an Air, For air Force brat, and so, um, you know, certainly a lot of those pilots came from the military. They got military training, 
Um, there was kind of a known quantity. We have a different path for pilots coming up today um, and different need. And so we did look at many of the different types of training scenarios, some that we don't even have in the U.S., like ab initio training. And so I do think that we're facing some challenges, certainly some challenges that we've investigated um, in smaller operators, um, 135 operations, some of the regional operators. There are different types of pressures that are out there. And so uh, we, we do pay close attention to those. But in, for the most part, we look at them on an accident by accident basis. And I think you're, you're asking for a broader look. Um, that might be something that we would take on in the future, but we did make a number of recommendations about how to enhance pilot professionalism, and a lot of that has to do with training, uh, how people are trained, where they're trained, um, and also what kind of leadership or mentoring that they get when they're in the job. And so we see a lot of areas for improvement uh, in that, and we've made recommendations to that effect. But I will say that I think our pilots today are being monitored and evaluated so much more than pilots 30 or 40 years ago. I, I see many heads shaking. I know many of you come from the industry. You probably have robust FOQA programs, ASAP programs. Um, it's about understanding what to do with that information. There can be mountains and mountains of information, but if you don't ask the right questions, you're not gonna identify the problems. And very often we see in our accident investigations that some of that leading indicator information was there all along, but it actually wasn't tapped. And so I think that's what we're probably going to have to get better at, is that, that data piece of it. Thank you for your question. On behalf of the Wings Club, uh, on behalf of our I industry... I thought you might ask me a question. <laughs> oh, I have plenty of those. Yeah. Um, on behalf of the Wings Club, on behalf of our industry, and personally, uh, I want to thank you, Chairman Hurstman, for the, uh, the respect uh, the authority and the credibility that you have brought to the NTSB and, and that the NTSB and your merry brand of brothers, thank you John, have brought to the aviation industry. Your knowledge of the industry is shown today and, and it's terrific. We thank you for all you personally do for our industry. Um, and I have a little plaque, if I may. Presented to the Honourable Deborah Hurstman in grateful appreciation for your presentation at the Aviation Leader Series at the Wings Club, New York City, June 2013. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay.